when we think about the nature and character of God, I think for most of us, there are certain attributes that really stand out. And there are some that we are far more appreciative than others. It's wondrous to think that God is all powerful and that he can do anything that he wants. That he can will the universe into existence. That he can raise the dead, give sight to the blind, and make the lame to leap and walk. And it's incredible to know that God is all powerful. It's incredible and scary at the same time that God knows everything. That God doesn't learn. That God knows everything that will happen and everything that could happen. He has exhaustive knowledge of all things. But I think there are certain attributes of God that really stand out. And for myself, it's ones that I reiterate over and over again, things like the fact that God is merciful and that God is gracious. Where would we be if God were not merciful, if he were not gracious, if he were not compassionate? Would we not still be dead in our sins and trespasses? Would we not be lost and on the broad road to destruction? That we would be living without hope not only for this life, but the life to come. There's another attribute of God that this passage will, will deal with, and it is the faithfulness of God, or the trustworthiness of God. And when we look at this passage, remember the context of Romans 9 through 11 is dealing with, with the nation of Israel. And why is it that in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that by and large it is the Gentiles who are being saved and not God's chosen people, Israel? Why is it they are that they are rejecting the gospel? Is the gospel that Paul is preaching, is it a false gospel? Is there something wrong with the gospel itself? Has God rejected his people? Or as we have seen, is the fault with Israel itself? That they will not believe. That they are stumbling over the stumbling stone. And here we see that God is faithful. He is faithful to his promises. And I am so thankful for that. I am so thankful that when God has promised in his word that he would save us to the uttermost, that that is sure and true and amen. And so Paul asks the question in light of what he said in chapter 10, verse 21, concerning Israel, that is a stiff-necked people. He calls them here disobedient and obstinate. Is God, therefore, going to reject his people who have rejected him? And Paul is going to answer that question throughout chapter 11. The beginning, though, I want to look at the faithfulness of God. Verse 21 of chapter 10, But as for Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's very important that you remember that verse because chapter 11, verse 1, is not written in a vacuum. It's a continuation. And so he's talking about the fact that God has continued to offer his hand of mercy and grace to Israel and that they continue to reject him. You read the Old Testament over and over and over again. They departed from their God and they chased after the other gods. They built altars to pagan deities. They were engaged in gross immorality and idolatry. And the God who had been faithful to them, they were unfaithful. They played the harlot. 
And yet God continued to stretch out that hand of mercy and grace. And so when we look at chapter 10, verse 21, it tells us that God knows what Israel is like. In fact, he knew what they were like or what they would be like before he even chose them. And this sets the stage for chapter 11 because God will not reject them because of what they have done and what they are doing because he already knew what they would do and he chose them nonetheless. So what they would do and what they are doing really is inconsequential to his choice. He chose them by grace and mercy, not because of their merit or their deservedness. And that's equally true of us. So when Christ saved you, he saved you knowing everything that you would do throughout your entire life. He knew that you would sin over and over and over and over again. He knew that time after time, you would reject him and that you would trample the name of his dear son, that you would blaspheme his name, that you would sin against him, and yet he chose to save you. And when God entered into a relationship with Israel, he knew all that he would do and he chose them by grace. And God will sustain them because he is a gracious God and because he is a faithful God. In the Old Testament, we read over and over again that God is a faithful God. If you want to turn for a minute to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, we read about God's faithfulness. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, there we read, you shall know, therefore, that Yahweh, your God, he is God. The what? The faithful God. Who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. God is a faithful God. He is faithful. In chapter 32, in verse 4, there we once again read about God's faithfulness. It says, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Remember, everything that God is, he is to the infinite degree. So when we're saying that God is faithful, we're not saying that God is sometimes faithful or mostly faithful. God is completely and totally faithful. He cannot be otherwise. God cannot be unfaithful. And so to the maximal degree possible... God is faithful. By the way, does God's character, his nature change? Do we not read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? And so not only was God faithful in the past and God is faithful in the present, but God is faithful in the future. And so when God promises you something, it will forever be true. Scripture teaches that God cannot deny himself. That is, God cannot go against his own nature. It is impossible for God to be unfaithful. God can't go against his word. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. In the book of Joshua, an interesting passage in Joshua chapter 23 In verse 14, Joshua 23, in verse 14. 
Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have come to pass for you, not one word of them has failed. Israel is being reminded about what God was like in the past. What did God say he would do? He said that he would deliver them from Egypt and that he would lead them into the land of promise. Well, what's happened in the book of Joshua? They have come out of the wilderness. They've come out of Egypt and they are now possessing the land. So when they want to think about what God is going to do in the future, he tells them, think about what God promised in the past, and you will see that to every point he was faithful. And so can you trust God with the future? Absolutely, because he is faithful. Psalm 31 in verse 5. Whoops, I made a mistake here. Okay, skip over that one. I wrote it down wrong. Turn to the New Testament, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. I'd already mentioned that God is not a man that he should lie. In the book of Titus, remember all the T's are together, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Titus 1 and verse 2. in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised for all eternity. Why is God faithful? Because God cannot say something and then not follow through on it. If God says it, he will do it. He can't lie. And then one more, Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So where do we get the idea of faithfulness from Romans chapter 11? Well, it has to do with the promises of God. How do we know that God will fulfill his promises? It's because of his nature, his character. Because he's faithful. And the promise that is being referred to here is what is known as the Abrahamic covenant. So when he's talking here about has God rejected his people it's talking about the Abrahamic covenant where really God created the nation of Israel through one man, Abram, who became Abraham. And God entered into a covenant with him where he told him that he would create a nation from him. And that nation would go on to be called the nation of Israel. And they were given certain privileges and blessings that Paul referenced in chapter 9, in verse 4, where he says, Who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Paul was talking there presently that these things belong to Israel. He didn't say that they no longer belong to them or at one time 
but these were their, their, their present possession. To the Israelites, God had given these things. He had given them the covenants and the promise, who is the Messiah. And so God entered into this covenant. And so the question is, has God rejected his people? And the answer is no, because God is faithful. And how you understand this is the nature of the promises themselves. The nature of God's relationship with Israel. And what you see is what God swore on oath to do to Israel. Only he was bound to it. It was never conditioned on Israel's obedience. Never. And so Israel cannot be rejected because God swore by oath to himself that he would never, ever cast them off. Now, where does this begin? Well, it begins in chapter 12 of Genesis. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is the original giving of the, the Abrahamic covenant. And it is further developed later on. And certain aspects of, aspects of it are um, extrapolated and further refined and developed in other covenants. But those covenants are rooted in the original Abrahamic covenant. So if we talk, for instance, of the Palestinian or land covenant in Deuteronomy 30 and other places where God promised uh, a special portion of land that would be their eternal inheritance, uh, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, where God says, these are the dimensions of the land that you will possess. Okay, that's an extrapolation and development from the original Abrahamic covenant. Remember, God says, you know, go from Ur of the Chaldeas to the land I will give you. And later on, when he tells the, the Jews when they're coming out of Egypt, that he's going to give them the land flowing with, of, with milk and honey, the land of promise, the one that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's further developed in the Davidic covenant, where God promises them that they would have a king who would be greater than David, the Messiah who would be Lord and King. In fact, there are allusions in the Psalms to the fact that this king would not be a mere man, but would be God himself who would reign over God's people Israel forever on the throne of David. That's 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we also see that God promised eternal life for them. He promised to save them and redeem them from their sins in the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, and other places, where he would take their heart of stone, replace it with a heart of flesh, and he would give them the Holy Spirit, and he would remember their sins no more. They would be cleansed and redeemed. But all of this comes out of the Abrahamic covenant, which in chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, it says, And Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your land and from your kin and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So there you see the land. Okay, the one you're not going to see is the Davidic covenant, which is a later development. Because remember, God's original intent, even though he knew what was going to happen, Deuteronomy tells us that he knew what was going to happen. They were designed to be a theocracy with no king other than God. But they wanted to be like the pagan nations around, right? So God even said in Deuteronomy, he said, when they ask for a king, make sure it's not like this. So God knew that they were going to ask for a king. But he says here that the land I will show you, I will make you into a what? A great nation. The nation of Israel. And I will bless you and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. Now, there's something interesting here. Remember, I've told you over and over again that the new covenant is specifically for Israel, but it overflows that the blessings apply to the Gentiles as well, to anyone who believes. And that new covenant was instituted in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my body, which is for you. This is 
the blood of the new covenant. And the author of Hebrews goes into great detail about the new covenant and how it applies to all who believe. And this is developed from where he says here, and through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. When God brings salvation through their Messiah, the benefits of his death are for the entire world. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is the first giving of the Abrahamic covenant, and he continues to develop it throughout the book of Genesis. We see eventually how he reaffirms it with, with Isaac and then with Jacob. But I want you to see something very interesting concerning this covenant if you turn to Genesis chapter 15. So why is it that God cannot, not just that he won't, but God cannot reject Israel? Chapter 15 tells us exactly why. It's the nature of the covenant and the provision of the covenant. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am, your, I am a shield to you. Your, war, your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O oh Lord Yahweh, what will you give me as I go on being childless? Remember, he promised a child, but it's not coming. It's not coming. It's not coming. Eventually, they take things into their own hands, and Sarah tells them to take her handmaid, uh, Hagar, and, and they have a son, Ishmael. But God says, that's not the one. You're doing it your way, not my way. I promised that I would give you a son, and I am a faithful God, right? And so what happened? Sarah, who was said to be barren and too old to have a child, and Abraham, who was said to be too old, she got pregnant, gave birth to a son. God was faithful to his promise. And here, God enters into a specific type of covenant with Abram. He says, as I go on being childless, and the heir of my house is, house is Eliezer of Damascus, one of his servants, his chief servant, and Abram said, since you have given no seed to me, behold, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came of saying, this one will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and says, now look toward the heavens and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall be your seed. Then he believed in Yahweh and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord Yahweh, how may I know that I will possess it? Okay, O ye of little faith. God promised that that should be enough. But God sees us in our frailty and our weakness. And he says, okay. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and split them into parts down the middle and laid each part opposite the other, but he did not split apart the birds. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern world, there were different types of covenants, not only different types of categories, so, for instance, one that's, that's particular with Israel in, in the Mosaic Law is called the suzerainty vassal treaty. So, basically, you have a superior with an inferior. So, a suzerain like a king or, or a leader with a vassal, those underneath them. And so, it's disproportionate, but they enter into a relationship. And that's what God does with, with Israel, where you have the God of the universe entering into a covenant with his vassal. And it follows certain patterns, and, and uh, these patterns are fairly consistent. But that's just a, a generic category. But within them, there are, are categories like a salt covenant, where you exchange pinches of salt. Or there's a shoe covenant, where you exchange sandals. But the strongest covenant in existence was what's called a blood covenant. And it was symbolized through the slaying of animals. 
And so here these animals are brought, and God specifies what animals are to be brought. And Abraham sacrifices them. He cuts them in half. Okay, so you cut an animal in half, what do you assume happened to the animal? It died, right? Its blood was shed, it died. So God enters into this ceremony with Abraham in a blood covenant. And the idea with a blood covenant is if you break the covenant and just like that animal's blood was shed, your blood will be shed. So it's not something where uh, a fine is levied or you get a slap on the wrist if you break the covenant. No, no, no. You break this covenant, you forfeit your life. So nobody enters into a blood covenant loosely or without thinking it through. Your life literally depends upon it. There is no stronger covenant relationship. Now, that's the first part. The seriousness or the strength, the binding force of this covenant is blood. You forfeit it, your blood will be shed. Your life is forfeited. So he brings them, he, he puts the birds, he puts them, then it gives a, a narrative where he talks about birds of prey coming and he chases them away. Now look at verse 12. Now it happened that when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Okay, this is the same wording that's used of Adam when God put him into a deep sleep, when then God took the, the rib or the side to, to make the woman. So he falls into a deep sleep. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Then God said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for a hundred years. But I will also judge the nation to whom they are enslaved. So we know that this is the fulfillment in Egypt. And afterwards, they will come out with many possessions. We know that this was completely fulfilled. Remember, God had it so that when they left Egypt, the Egyptians, they plundered Egypt, the Bible says. They just handed over everything. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. And in the fourth generation, they will return to me for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now it happened that the sun had set and it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. Now this is a theophany. God appears in physical form here to demonstrate his presence. Now, when this type of covenant was enacted, not only would the animals be slain and their parts, but each party would walk through. So you pass through it as a symbol of your commitment to the covenant. It's like signing on the dotted line. So you walk between them, and that symbolizes that you are binding yourself by blood to the promises. So whatever your part is in it, you are binding yourself to that. And if you fail to uphold your bargain, then you forfeit your life. Now, Abram has been put into a deep sleep. Notice who and who alone passes through the animal pieces. Only God. So who and who alone is bound to the covenant stipulations? Only God is. So it says here, Now it appeared that the sun had set, and it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. On that day, Yahweh cut a covenant with Abram, saying, to your seed I give this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the river, the great river, the river Euphrates, uh, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Raphaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So when God enters into covenant with Abraham, he cuts a covenant with him. He only binds himself to the stipulations. 
Remember I've told you before that there are two different categories of, of covenant, conditional and unconditional. This is an unconditional covenant as far as Israel is concerned. God doesn't say, if you do this, I will do this. That's what the Mosaic covenant, is. it's conditioned. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. So it's conditioned upon their obedience. There are no conditions attached to the Abrahamic covenant and its extrapolations. The Palestinian or land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. All of them, only God binds himself to those covenants. So they're called unconditional and they're called, um, they are unilateral. Okay, they're not bilateral, they're unilateral. Only God is responsible to uphold the covenant. The mosaic is bilateral. If you do this, then God will do this. If you do this, God will do this. So God responds to Israel's response. But in the Abrahamic covenant, it's not the case. And by the way, by the time Paul is writing Romans 11, the Mosaic covenant is gone. Remember, he previously said Christ is the end of the law. What law? The Mosaic covenant and the law that's attached to it. So why is the, is the Mosaic covenant gone? Because God replaced it with the new covenant. And the new covenant was promised beforehand. Now, not only does God seal the covenant with this blood uh, ceremony, but over and over again, God refers back to his promise. So we see, for instance, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24, and Deuteronomy 9, 5, and Jeremiah 11, verse 5, that God talks about what he had promised, and he said that he did it on oath. God swore an oath. Who did he swear the oath to? To himself. The author of Hebrews said that God had to swear by himself because there was nothing higher than him to swear upon. And so God is putting his very character on the line, saying, I will do this according to my own nature. And so why is it that God cannot reject Israel? Because he entered into the strongest covenant with them and he made it a unilateral, unconditional covenant that only he was obligated to keep and uphold. So God would have to deny himself in order to abrogate that covenant. And he never will. And when he made that covenant, he knew everything that Israel would ever do. He knew everything that Abraham would do. Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes. And when God entered into the new covenant with us, he knew everything we would ever do. And so that's one of the things that we don't strive to keep our faith, to keep our salvation. It is eternal. It is secured in heaven by God himself. Why is it that not only are we saved, but we stay saved? It's because of the faithfulness of God. It's his character. And I said one of the things that I, I love most about the faithfulness of God is it reminds me that when I am unfaithful to God, day after day after day after day, God remains faithful. And I'm so thankful that my salvation doesn't rest upon me and my faithfulness. Because the same day I got it, I would have lost it. So praise be to God that he is a faithful God. We see also about God's faithfulness to his covenant passages like in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 12. Now notice this one, verse 22. God says, For Yahweh will not abandon his people. 
Here's your answer. Will God reject Israel? No, he says he will not abandon them ever. Why? On account of his great name. God's not going to keep them and uphold them for their namesake, but for his own. You remember when Moses used this? When after uh, he comes down, this is Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and he sees what they're doing. He finds out that they made this calf and he smashes the Ten Commandments. And God says, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to destroy this people and I'm going to start again with you. And he, and he says, God, no, 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 you can't do that. Not because of them, but what are people going to think about you? God, for your name's sake, do not do this. So why won't God cast off Israel? For his name's sake, for his glory, for his honor, for his fame. Why won't God cast you off? Not because of your deservedness, but for his name's sake, for his glory, for his honor, because he is faithful. And so here we read that, that God will not break his promises to Israel because of his name's sake. By the way, the psalmist does that too. When he's praying out, and he's saying, crying out to God. And he says, God, do this. For your name's sake. You're praying out to God for healing. God, do this that you might be glorified. Do this for your name's sake. Do this in a way, Lord, that you get all the praise, all the glory. I don't deserve your healing hand upon myself. But God, I pray that you would do this so that people would praise you and thank you and give you glory. And hallow your name in all the earth. Psalm 89 talks about this. Psalm 89 beginning at verse 31. If they profane my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with striking. So here we, we read about Israel being disobedient to God, to them being this stiff-necked people. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my, what? Faithfulness. My covenant I will not profane, nor will I alter what comes forth from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever in his throne as before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky is faithful. Psalm 94, verse 14. For Yahweh will not abandon his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. Psalm 106. Verses 44 and 45. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry of lamentation, and he remembered for them his, what? His covenant. And relented according to the abundance of his loving kindness, he also made them objects of compassion in the presence of all their captors. God will always remember his covenant. Okay, back to Romans 11. So with that backdrop in mind, one that God is faithful, completely, totally faithful, and what God has entered into with Israel in the Abrahamic covenant, along with it, the Palestinian, the Davidic, and the new covenants, that God swore by himself to uphold it, he entered into a blood covenant that only himself was bound to the stipulations. So it's unconditional and unilateral. Can God, will God reject them? Okay, so Israel has rejected Messiah. 
He has rejected this. They have rejected the Savior. Even though God has stretched out his hand to them all day long. Verse 11, as God rejected his people, may it never be, or God forbid. In Greek, this is me genoita, which is the strongest negative in the Greek language. So he's saying no with multiple exclamation marks after it. Absolutely not. It's impossible for God to have done that. No, no, no. God has not rejected his people. His people have rejected him, but he has not rejected them. He will not. Remember we talked about last time? Why is it that Israel is not being saved? Is there a problem with the gospel? Is there a problem with God? No, it's all their fault. They will not believe. It's willful. Now, Paul offers himself up as exhibit A. That God is not rejecting Israel because he himself is an Israelite who has been saved by God's grace. You can't say that God's rejecting Israel. I'm one of them, and I have been saved. God hasn't rejected me. More than that, go back to the earliest chapters of the book of Acts, where we see multiplied thousands of people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the audience? Who are those people? Okay, those first Christians were Jews, not Gentiles. Now, by the time that Paul is writing Romans, things have changed. The majority now are Gentiles, but God was saving and is saving Jews. There is a remnant. And while people might think that all the Jews are rejecting the gospel, that is patently false. And Paul offers himself up as an example. No, no, no. God hasn't rejected Israel. I'm one of them. Notice he uses the word Israelite, not the word Jew. If there's a difference, and many believe that there is, is often proselytes were considered Jews. You could be a Gentile, but if you became a proselyte to the Jewish religion, especially if you were all in, you were circumcised, if you were male, then you were considered to be a Jew. But an Israelite was a special type of Jew, if you will, and that is they were ones who were literally, physically, bodily descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he uses the term Israelite. I am a literal, physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I am an heir to the covenant promises, Paul is saying. And he says what tribe he's from. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, elsewhere he gives all kinds of credentials on his Jewishness. He talks about that he's not an average, you know, Jew. Yeah, he's from the tribe of of. of uh, Benjamin, he's named after the most famous Benjamite. He's named after King Saul. And he tells him that, well, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he's a Hebrew-speaking Jew, not a Greek-speaking Jew. And he says that he is from the Pharisees. And as to the law, he was blameless. So he gives all kinds of Jewish credentials. Here he's not focused on that. Here he's talking about his physical lineage. Has God rejected Israel? No. And I am an example of that. Now, I guess if everybody had a copy of the book of Acts, he could have said, well, if you read Acts chapter 2 and, and such, you'll see, you know, so many thousands were saved on this day and the gospel was preached and so many people were saved on this day and you could see that thousands of people had been, been saved. He could have referred, I guess, to the, the apostles who were, who were by and large, you know, all... all uh, uh, Jews, but he doesn't do that. He refers to himself. He says, well, God has not cast off Israel, but I am an Israelite, a seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. 
Now, the word foreknew means to know ahead of time. Some people have so loaded this word up with meanings that God chose and selected and loved beforehand. None of those connotations are imprinted in the word. The word means to foreknow, and that's all it means. To know beforehand. And I think in the context, it means this. When God chose Israel, what did he know about them? Everything. If God knows everything that will ever happen, nothing will catch God by surprise. God doesn't have to react to anything. He knows everything in advance. So when God chose Abram and entered into covenant with him, God knew everything that would ever happen. So in the context, when he's talking about the fact that Israel has rejected God, God knew that. He knew they would do that. Yet he still chose them. So obviously his covenant wasn't based upon whether they would accept him or reject him because God knew that they would reject him and knowing that, why would he enter into covenant with them? Because it wasn't part of it. God's covenant was based on grace, and Paul's going to tell us that in verse 6. It's all of grace. It wasn't of works or merit or deservedness. It's grace. God entered into a covenant with Abraham because God is a gracious God, and God keeps covenant because he's a faithful God. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appeals to the God of Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. Now go and read that story. It's kind of funny. Remember, you know, just had the incident with the prophets of Baal and that and then they're chasing him to kill him and he runs away and he's hiding. And, and God says, why are you hiding? Like, what, what are you doing here? Well, God, you know, I'm the only one left. God said, you're not the only one left. I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bent the knee to Baal. So what's he telling us here? He, well, he's really not concerned about the 7,000 prophets of Baal. He's concerned with the mentality of Elijah. Elijah basically thinks it's all over. God, it's over with. I'm the last one. They're going to get me and it's done. Hold on a second here, Elijah. You think that all my plans rest on you and what you will do or what will happen to you? So I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. I'm not sovereign over this. Elijah, where's your faith? No, no, God's in charge. He's sovereign. And God had kept for himself 7,000. God always has a remnant. So while people might be proclaiming that all Israel has rejected the gospel, that's false. There is a remnant, and there's a remnant in every generation. There's a remnant today of believing Jews. And by the end of the chapter, we're going to see that God is going to continue to keep his promise, and in the end, Israel will be saved. Now, one of the things I want you to, to look carefully at is... If you go home and you're reading verses 7 through 10, I want you to understand the context because it gives the impression that God is selecting certain individuals for salvation and the context is national Israel. Okay? The problem people get in is they slip and they make it into individuals when the context is talking about national Israel and God's promises to national Israel. So when you're reading these verses, you have to read them in context. God will always be faithful to the promises. There will always be a believing remnant, always. Because God has chosen Israel by grace. He's not talking about the selection of certain individuals. He's talking about his national promises to them. There will always be a believing remnant because of God's gracious provision. Now, how do you become part of the believing remnant? 
because you were selected in eternity? No, no, no. By faith. Hasn't he been telling us that over and over and over and over again? How are you elected in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? You are incorporated into him through faith. I'm just giving you that a bit ahead of time because we're going to actually go a little off script next time. We're going to talk about the broader concept of, of God's relationship to Israel and the church, which is important for understanding the context because some people say that, that God has cast off Israel and he's replaced it with the church and the church is fulfilling the promises to Israel, but it's fulfilling them uh, spiritually, and I'm going to hopefully show through scripture why I think that that is a false view. Okay, back to the text. So he quotes uh, the words of of, uh, of Elijah and the Lord, where the Lord says that he has kept for himself 7,000. And in this way, then, at the present time, a remnant, according to God's gracious choice, has also come to be. God's gracious choice of Israel. There will always be a remnant because of God's gracious provisions to Israel. So don't worry. Okay, here's, here's putting it in the context. Don't worry that Israel is going to fade into obscurity and they're all going to be lost. Don't worry about that. Not going to happen. Because God is going to uphold his covenant promises. Remember, the new covenant was for Israel. People will be saved. There will always be a remnant. Now, sadly, with Israel, when God tells them, tells us in chapter 10, verse 21, that they're a disobedient, obstinate people, it's interesting what God has to do to ultimately get their attention. What was it that Zechariah said? They will, they will look on him whom they've pierced. But if you read the book of Revelation, you see what God needs to do to get them to that point that they will believe. They're in the wilderness being supernaturally protected by God as the entire world is coming to assault them and obliterate them. And it's only by the miraculous hand of God that they are not obliterated. And just immediately before their destruction, they call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then Jesus Christ comes back and saves them and redeems them. Context, context, context. So he says here in this way, verse 5, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice has also come to be. But if it is by grace, it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What's he doing there? He's reminding us of what Israel's problem is. He just told us in chapter 10, why aren't they being saved? Because they're not pursuing the law by faith. They're trying to work towards their own salvation. They're trying to merit God's favor, and that's impossible. Scripture tells us, Paul has already told us several times in the book of Romans, by grace we are saved. Well, he says here, if it's by grace, it excludes works. If it's by works, it excludes grace. It's one or the other. The problem is Israel's trying to do it by works and it's a dead end. Remember, you cannot go to heaven by being good. You must be what? Perfect. Nobody can do it. That's the point. The point of the law was to show them their need. And I love the example of, of Martin Luther. It's the perfect illustration of what the law was intended to do. Martin Luther, remember I said, he hated God because he says, I can't do it. God, you want me to be righteous as you are righteous? I can't. It's impossible. I cannot do it. And he says he hated God. It was like he was dangling it over him and the carrot was just out of reach and he could never get it. But then he realized that's not what God was saying. God was saying that if you would come in faith, he would give you his own righteousness. So you would be perfect, not your own perfection, but the perfection of Jesus Christ. But the Jews were trying to work 
to attain it. They were trying to reach up to the stars and pluck them down, and they could not. And they were blind to it. They were blind to it. Remember, I, I made reference to what John MacArthur said, and it be beautifully illustrates it. He says they were pulling God down, elevating themselves, and meeting in the minute, in the middle. They didn't understand God. They didn't understand His holiness, His righteousness. And they exalted themselves. And therefore they were lost. So he reminds them, God hasn't rejected Israel. Israel's rejected God. They've rejected His provision. And why are they in the mess they are in? Because salvation is by grace alone and they're trying to get it by works. If it's by works, then grace is no longer grace. Remember, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. So salvation is either by grace or it's not. God is either giving you what you deserve, what you earned, what you, what, what's rightfully yours, or if it's by grace, God's giving you what you don't deserve. And sadly, they were blinded by religion. The faithfulness of God. Israel may have rejected God, but because God is faithful, he will never cast off Israel. And God will never cast you off. If, here's the big thing, if, if you belong to God through Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure because he is faithful. Remember, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me, he says, none will be lost. Your salvation is held in trust by him who is faithful. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that God is faithful because I'm not. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we exalt you, we praise you, we we are overwhelmed by who you are, what you are, that you are a faithful God. Because, Lord, we are not faithful. And we, Lord, just give you thanks that you are faithful to all your promises and that you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. One day in the future, Lord, you're not going to say, I changed my mind. Oh, Lord God, you are worthy. And sometimes, Lord, we need a jolt, a reminder of just how worthy you really are. What is man that you are mindful of him? Lord, we are lost for words this day. And so we just humbly bow before you. And we praise your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen.